Hi, Angus and I are back and today we're going to talk about infancy and early childhood biosocial development. So we're going to talk about what's going on inside the baby's brain and inside the baby's body during those first two years. So we'll focus on the rapid growth of the infant both physically and specifically neurobiologically. First, let's talk about some important markers in the baby's physical growth. The average newborn weighs about seven and a half pounds when he's born and is approximately 20 inches long. Baby's weight doubles by four months of age and triples by the time the baby is one. So it's important to recognize that because this is such a fast trajectory in the baby's growth, anything that might block that growth or impede it or harm it could have serious long-term consequences. So this is why neglect or abuse during the first two years of life can be seen as very serious to a baby's health. By the age of two, child is about three feet tall and that is about half of their adult height. During the first few months of life, when the baby starts gaining weight, we don't see that weight gain in terms of a baby's height. What we see is an increase in the baby's fat. So a baby's really going to plump out during those first few months and there's a very good reason for this. This fat provides insulation to keep the baby warm and also it provides nourishment in times when a baby simply cannot eat. So in times when a baby is teething for example or is sick and not feeling well, baby still will have access to nourishment. When this nourishment is temporarily inadequate the body has a protective response to how it utilizes that nourishment. The baby's body stops growing, but the baby's brain does not. The baby's brain gets first dibs, so to speak, on all that nourishment, because that is the most important part of a growing baby's body. This process is called head sparing. And again, this is where the brain is fed first in times in which nutrition is either not available or the baby is too sick or too uncomfortable to eat. So let's talk about some of these brain changes during the first two years. At birth, the baby's skull is large. In fact, it's disproportionately large to the rest of the body. When a baby is born, his skull is about 25% the size that it will be as an adult, except his body is only 5% of the size. By age of two, that head is about 75% the size of his adult head. But again, his body is much smaller. The body is only about 20% of the size of his adult body. So what's going on inside the brain during those first two years? This is a process called transient exuberance. This is where the synaptic connections between the neurons in the brain increase five times. So that at the end of the first two years of life, a baby has 100 trillion synaptic connections in his brain. This explosive growth is followed by a process called pruning. And pruning is where the unused and unnecessary synaptic connections are gobbled up by what's called glial cells. And these are cells that are nestled around the nerve cells in the brain. So pruning is key, and it is a key process in efficient brain functioning. If we use the analogy of a computer, if a computer is constantly loaded with information and it reaches the point where there is no more space for new information, it would shut down. And our brain can be seen from a similar light. In order for it to be efficient and continue to remain efficient, those unused bits of information are gobbled away. 
All right, next let's talk about stress in the brain. The role of experience in the brain is exemplified in a process in which a baby might experience stress. So if a baby experiences stress, cortisol is excreted by the baby along with other stress hormones. And we can measure this either through the baby's blood or the baby's saliva. If too many stress hormones are produced early in a baby's development, the developing brain becomes incapable of normal stress responses. So here are two examples of this. A baby can either, or a young child, will either overreact or underreact to some sort of a conflict or a stress response. One child might be uh, displaying severe physical aggression towards another child who accidentally tripped on him. This is an example of unregulated stress response. Another child might shut down if another child takes his or her pencil, for example, and might feel completely incapable of seeking out help to get that pencil back. In fact, researchers have demonstrated in repeated studies that there is indeed a biochemical link between early caregiving and the development of specific brain regions that regulate emotions. A person's ability to handle stress is directly impacted by the early caregiving experience. Two of the brain regions that have been studied in relation to early caregiving experience are the right prefrontal lobe and the amygdala. If you're interested in looking at this topic further, I would suggest that you Google Dr. Alan Shore, who is a professor at UCLA in the Geffen School of Medicine, and he is widely recognized as an expert on early brain development as related to early caregiving experience. Next, I want to talk about necessary and possible experiences in brain development. William Greenow identified two experience-related aspects to brain development. The first experience-related aspect that he identified is called experience expectant. And these are basic common experiences that must happen, that are necessary for the brain to mature in a healthy way. And fortunately, these are experiences that usually do happen to every child. An example of this is responsive caregiving. If a baby's cries are met with attempts to determine the cause for the baby's discomfort, then the baby's brain will grow in a normal, healthy way. Another example is if a baby has access to a stimulating environment and the ability to explore his or her world. And it doesn't matter if this environment is um, rich or poor, but what matters is if the baby has the ability to explore and play, then that baby's brain will develop in a normal way. The second type of brain-related aspects of development is what we call experience-dependent. And these are experiences that might happen or they might not happen. And whether or not they happen is what accounts for the differences in a child's brain. So for example, how a mother reacts to a baby's frustration will indeed impact how that baby's brain develops. If a mother responds to a baby's frustration in a synchronous, caring, loving, responsive way, then that baby's brain will develop normally. If a mother responds to a baby's frustration with an intolerant and angry and abusive response, then we will
will see a difference in how that right prefrontal lobe and that amygdala develop. Another example is if a child is exposed to multiple languages early in his life. That baby's brain will show a difference in the language processing center than a baby's brain who is not exposed to multiple languages. So in short, early brain growth is rapid and it also reflects experience. So caressing a newborn, talking to a pre-verbal infant, or even showing caring to a toddler are essential for normal brain development.